thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, my name is, is Michael Biersick. Unlike Ribbing, I don't have something fun to say about my name other than the fact that it indicates I was born in the United States about 1980. Uh, it was a very popular name at the time. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a variety of topics that relate to the application of control experimentally to, uh, to qubit systems. Um, as some of you may know, uh, in addition to my role as a professor at the University of Sydney in the Center for Engineered Quantum Systems, uh, just the end of last year we started a venture capital backed a uh, company called Q-Control, uh, where our focus is to bring the power of control engineering to quantum systems, to help uh, researchers and manufacturers alike leverage the knowledge that I think is, uh, is collectively shared by the many people in this room. Uh, and uh, we're, fa we're funded by a few different VCs. One is, uh, is Main Sequence Ventures in Australia. Another is uh, Horizons Ventures, which is the private technology investment portfolio company of uh, Li Ka-Shing in Hong Kong. Uh, and then uh, just on Tuesday, we'll be announcing, you get the sneak peek, that uh, we have a new investment round from Sequoia Capital and from Data Collective, which is one of the earliest investors in, in Rigetti, for instance. So I'll primarily be talking about uh, work that's experimental coming from the university labs, but I wanted to give just a little motivation for uh, why we are excited enough to start a company around this. Um, our inspiration comes uh, from historical analogy. And the one that I really like is the story of the Wright brothers. Many of you will be familiar with the notion that the Wright brothers, of course, at Kitty Hawk were the first to fly. Uh, but that notion is, is incorrect. People have been lying to you for a long time. They were not the first to fly. They were the first to engage in manned, powered, controlled flight. They entered an industry which was actually very active. There were many other competitive organizations that were building aircraft that were successfully getting off the ground and lifting people. But what they did was something really quite different. They brought the perspective of bicycle engineers to an established industry. And they overturned what was then the conventional wisdom, suggesting that in designing an aircraft, one should build a system that achieves what was known as inherent stability, that no matter what the pilot did, the airplane would keep flying. Because they were bicycle engineers, they looked at this very differently, and their aircraft had a huge amount of control afforded to the pilot over, the, say, the shape and the orientation of the wings. And of course, uh, we all know that they were very successful at the end of the day, and the insights they brought of, say, three-axis control for aircraft, roll, pitch, and yaw, uh, all of you would have used it to, uh, to get here, presuming you, you came on an airplane. We're interested in bringing control engineering to quantum systems in a similar way, uh, with really the hope of helping to build this industry uh, alongside uh, the hardware manufacturers and all the researchers in academia and in industry alike. I just wanted to give a very brief bit of advertising before I get into the, the meat of the talk, which is that our first, uh, our first software package called Black Opal, it's a SaaS or, or a cloud-based platform, is being launched uh, on the 2nd of October. Um, for all of our friends like you, we're very happy to give uh, free alpha testing access. So please do take a look at qcontrol.com and we would love it if you signed up. Tell us what you like about the, uh, about the product. Uh, the content of that product is what is partially what I'll be talking to you about today. So this is the, uh, the real technical aspect of the talk. Um, what we'll be focusing on is the bottom layer of the software stack in a quantum computer where we're fundamentally interested in, say, dealing with errors. Uh, this is a picture from this PRX, first author was Cody Jones, where we'll look at this virtual layer that sits between the physical hardware devices and then higher level abstraction techniques for dealing with hardware errors like quantum error correction. And I'll, I'll give uh, just a bit of background and motivation, a very brief review of filter functions because I've talked about these before. I just wanna make sure we all understand the language I'll use throughout the experimental aspects of the talk. Uh, moving on to a continuation of what Lorenza talked about, provably optimal narrowband filters for noise spectral estimation or noise sensing, either in sensing applications or in noise characterization for quantum computing. I'll talk then as a very brief interlude about some work we did on randomized benchmarking as a tool to measure error correlations, not just error probabilities. And then we'll leverage the experiments that come from that in order to uh, demonstrate this thing that we call qubit virtualization, where we're looking at modifying not just the probability of error, but also the statistical properties of the residual errors using control theory. 
So uh, my, my academic team is an experimental lab. We perform experiments with trapped ions. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about them, really. The, the ions are exceptionally good as, uh, as qubits. The lifetimes are, are really long. T1 is as long as the age of the universe. T2 is many seconds or uh, minutes if you, uh, if you try hard. We're going to use deuterium ions, which have a transition near 12.6 gigahertz in the satellite communications band. We're going to do optical, opt optical state preparation, optical projective measurement, and microwave manipulation. The fidelities we typically achieve are something like five nines on single qubit operations. Uh, we also do lots of two qubit work, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. So just think that we have a very nice qubit, but what we wanna do is use that qubit as a tool to address this problem. And the problem is, is a kind of canonical one in our community. We all know that quantum systems become randomized either by their environments through ambient decoherence or through uh, the action of control where the control itself is faulty. That leads to some randomization of the quantum state. I'm primarily going to be talking about semi-classical noise today. How a control engineer looks at this, uh, uh, well, it, it depends on the, on the kind of control engineer, I guess. Uh, but many would do something like this. They would write down a block diagram where you consider some system under control that they call the plant. Uh, there's a controller that acts on it. There's a disturbance that the plant is subject to. And there's an input-output relationship and maybe a feedback loop. Now, the specific formulation here is not what I'm trying to uh, communicate to you, but rather the fact that there is a very simple heuristic tool in these block diagrams that allows for the analysis of this input-output relationship. Very few engineers will be doing detailed microscopic modeling of input-output in the time domain, say. They'll look at this system and they will simply know that the relationship between y of s and x of s here in, in, uh, in Laplace transform space is related just by this simple form, which is the forward path over one plus the product of the forward and the return path. That's just a rule. You can just look it up. It's a really beautiful, simple heuristic for understanding how to apply control engineering to stabilize unstable systems. Now, what we're going to focus on today is an application of this to quantum systems, where we will primarily focus on the open loop branch, that is the forward path here, given by the measurement feedback free part of, of the control. So uh, we're not going to talk about the bottom of this loop. Um, if you're more interested in things like closed loop control, uh, well, you can take a look at these two different papers from my team. This one was, was just this week, an editor's selection in FizzRev Applied about machine learning for predictive estimation on qubit dynamics subject to decoherence. And this one on predictive feed forward for uh, uh, trapped ion qubits in both clock settings and quantum information settings uh, for the next 40 minutes. You're welcome to read these if you prefer. Um, but I hope you don't because, because open loop control is actually exceptionally powerful. And uh, I really like it. The analogy that I use um, very frequently, and some of you would have seen this uh, uh, in the past in my talks, uh, for understanding how open loop control works is, is this image of a sprinkler system. It's a system that stabilizes a dynamically unstable system by coming on at, say, noon every day. Uh, it doesn't measure if it rained. It doesn't measure if the grass is wet or needs to be watered. It just comes on every day on a schedule. And as a result, it keeps your grass alive. So open loop control is well known and very powerful, and we want to port that over to the quantum domain, where now we'll be thinking about an input-output relationship, which is something like the time evolution of a quantum state. We have some input starting state, we have some output state of the qubit. The qubit is subject to noise, and the qubit is subject to some SU2 control, some rotations, some unitary rotations on the block sphere. Now, the idea of trying to attack this problem goes back many, many years. Uh, and in particular, the idea of moving to the Fourier domain in order to address this problem uh, certainly goes back to early work uh, from Karizki's team around 2000. Uh, if you look back in the literature far enough in NMR, you'll find similar formulations. But the, the trick has always been that when you have some noise on your qubit, which does not commute with the control that you're applying, uh, this is uh, a challenging problem. And writing down this Fourier domain representation of what the time domain controls are doing uh, was a challenge. And that was the challenge that my team took on. 
uh, a few years ago, and we came up with this generalized framework to write down transfer functions for non-commuting noise and control. Uh, this is work that we later collaborated with Lorenzo on. Lorenzo's team with uh, Gerardo generalized this even further, and then I'll come back and show you how we've generalized it further still. But the idea is that we can now work in the Fourier domain to understand what the action of the control is uh, on the temporal dynamics of the qubit. What you get is in, in some fashion, although you can represent this in different ways, an expression for, say, the fidelity of some operation, like a pi pulse or something much more complicated, written as the overlap integral, as we've seen in some previous talks, of the filter which describes the control and the noise represented as a power spectral density. So that's, that's very nice because now this looks a little bit like the G of S and the H of S I, saw, I showed you in the block diagrams before. And these filters are generally constructed in such a way that if we apply the appropriate time sequence of control operations of unitaries, we can reduce the sensitivity of that filter. We can actually improve the, the filtering performance of that filter or uh, conversely reduce the sensitivity of the qubit to noise. And so here's a, a, a kind of simple example. It's real data, but I've just dressed it up in a way that doesn't make it look like real data. Uh, for a, what we call a standard or a primitive control, which has a function of frequency, has this high susceptibility to noise. So in this integral, you have a high value here, which means that the fidelity goes down. And by contrast, if you use the right controls, you can drive the value of the filter down, like in this case, a, a high pass filter, in order to reduce sensitivity in this shaded region. So if you appropriately construct your control such that whatever the typical noise in your system is, uh, overlaps with the error suppressing, the noise suppressing part of your filter in the stop band, well then you drive up the fidelity of your operation. Right? That's the general idea. And it's nice because it's a really simple heuristic. And then we use that in a whole range of different applications. One was coming up with error suppressing strategies for quantum computing. Another with Lorenzo looking at the problem of long time low latency memory in quantum computers. Uh, applying this to composite pulse techniques to answer some fundamental questions in NMR effectively how slow does noise have to be for composite pulsing to work. And then we extended this to multi-qubit gates, uh, in our case in the mulmer sorensen interaction, where we looked at trying to decouple by control theory, by control uh, uh, techniques, um, the, the spin or the qubit degree of freedom in a trapped ion from the modes of motion when we perform these mulmer sorensen entangling gates. And uh, again, because this was a very rapid review of some of the things we've done before, uh, I wanted to point out that one of the things that QControl has built uh, in its toolkit is a whole algorithm for numerically calculating filter functions for arbitrary SUN operations. So if you give us some set of levels and some couplings that you have accessible in your system, for instance, you can apply a control field here or a control field here, we will give you the filters that describe the response of the system for different kind of modulations, and we can also optimize controls using these filters. So uh, for our friends from Rigetti, this is an example of a control uh, technique that we developed using this tool set in order to implement an eye swap in a way that relative to the standard control in the red has something like uh, six orders of magnitude reduced sensitivity to noise in the low frequency regime. Right? So this is an example of the kind of thing that we can create, and, and just to remind you, uh, these are, many of these are experimental papers where we validated this whole framework uh, repeatedly. So what I want to move on to now that we have this language of filters in our back pocket is uh, this first set of experiments uh, picking up where Lorenza left off, looking at how we can use this concept of noise filtering and filter transfer functions to perform spectral estimation in a provably optimal way. And this is uh, provably optimal in a very specific way that I'll describe. Um, this is the subject of this work that was published at the end of last year. If we return to that image of the simple block diagram for our qubit subject to open loop controls, what we're going to try to do now is understand what controls to apply to our qubit in order to perform noise sensing, to characterize the noise. Because in general, whatever the spectrum of the noise is, sometimes you can measure it directly and sometimes you can't, it will have a wide variety of different features. It may have some 1 over F type background, as is very common in many experimental uh, hardware platforms. We see it in trapped ions with B field fluctuations. In superconducting qubits, there's a whole range of, uh, of microscopic mechanisms that lead to this. But then it's very common to have things like 
uh, line frequency noise, and then noise that's coming from, say, switch mode power supplies that are somehow coupling in at, at much higher frequencies. If you want to deploy controls that are optimized for this noise, you need somehow to know something about the noise. Now, you can do fully automated uh, uh, optimization, as Ribbing was talking about, and as we did in 2009. Uh, where we automated a dynamic decoupling uh, sequence optimization procedure. But in general, having knowledge of the noise can be useful offline as well. And so we're going to try and think of ways to craft the filter that allows us to, in a kind of swept mode way, uh, uh, characterize in the frequency domain what exactly is going on in the noise. This brings some challenges. and. Uh, one of the challenges in the, in the sensing or the, uh, the remote detection, standoff detection community in the military is called clutter. That you're trying to pull a signal out of some background with clutter. Now that clutter can come from many different places. So if we look at the a simplified version of our qubit Hamiltonian, we have uh, some control that we apply. So that's like a, dri a driven operation on our qubit. We'll have a control noise term, which is multiplicative, so the, the faster you're driving, the bigger the noise. Uh, and then you may have some, say, ambient dephasing, some background magnetic field fluctuations or, or spin fluctuations in, a, in an integrated device. With this Hamiltonian, we see that there are a couple of different ways that the signal you want to pick out can be obscured. One of them uh, is ambiguity in the quadrature of noise that you're sensing. If you do a projective measurement on a qubit after some driven operation, a priori it's difficult to tell whether you have this kind of noise or this kind of noise. Do you have something that's proportional to the control or something that's additive as some background? So pulling this out is a challenge that we'll address, but I'll start with uh, this idea of spectral broadening, that the frequency response of the filter can lead you astray and allow you to pick up when you have a broadband background signals that uh, complicate your, your uh, understanding or your data fusion process based on the measurements you have. Here's an example of how you can really get bitten by this idea of spectral concentration or it's, in, it's kind of converse is spectral leakage. Let's say you want to do a measurement over a target band indicated by this shading here. If you use one of the typical filter design approaches in noise spectroscopy, like multipulse dynamic decoupling, as was uh, uh, discussed by Lorenza in terms of the Suter Alvarez algorithms, you get a, you're effectively taking the Fourier transform of a square wave and you get a main peak uh, in your target band, but then you also get the harmonics that come from that Fourier transform. So you can uh, unfortunately come up with scenarios in which your noise conspires against you such that if you're trying to sense this thing in the background in the gray, well, it, you get, may get a signal that comes from overlapping your target band with that spectrum, or you may have shifted your target band very far away from that, but due to uh, bad luck, the signal that comes from the harmonics overlap with some other noise spectrum could be just as big in the ultimate signal that you're trying to uh, uh, analyze. So what we wanted uh, to do, and, and as Lorenza told you about a little bit, was start to ask the question of how we can minimize spectral leakage, such that if we have some frequency range that we want to, uh, to probe, we want to maximize the weight of the Fourier response of our control in that band, minimize the amount outside. And the question is, what controls should we use in order to achieve that? What should we do in the time domain to give us that kind of spectral concentration? Now, I mean, if you were here the other day, you already know what the answer is. Uh, and the answer comes from, uh, you know, digital signal processing work in the 70s and 80s uh, from David Slepian, who said that there are provably optimal solutions to this problem of spectral concentration, such that if you choose these waveforms, which are the solution to a particular eigenvalue equation, and you compare against, say, a standard control, this is the kind of control you would have if you do just a Ramsey interrogation or you do a driven Rabi oscillation. Compare that to a Slepian waveform. You see that in this target band here, uh, there's something like 80 dB of difference in, for the engineers in the room uh, in the spectral leakage outside of that target band. And it comes, as you can see, by effectively smoothing out the, uh, the pulse form in just the right way, right? So these sequences are really nice because they're provably optimal, and there's a whole family of them. There's, uh, there's uh, an infinite order of, of Slepians in principle, uh, 
They're all orthogonal, which is really nice because it allows us to do multiple measurements and combine them according to the multi-taper that Lorenzo talked about. Um, if you look at them, they, they look a little bit like the Legendre polynomials, the, uh, the solutions to the one-dimensional particle in a box. Um, but the idea of what we do in these experiments, again, as was mentioned the other day, is to use these as the control waveforms that shape a pulse of, of resonant radiation, right? So we have a qubit at 12.6 gigahertz. This is going to be the control envelope applied to uh, that 12.6 gigahertz, such that instead of doing some offline data processing and using these as window functions in the data processing, what we're going to do instead is directly window the qubit such that it is only sensitive over a particular frequency range. So in order to, to start the experiments on this, we did a system identification approach, which is just a way of characterizing the response of these controls. What we do is we have some Slepian waveform. We're going to apply that Slepian waveform, and we're going to add to it a single frequency tone. And that single frequency tone, in this case, is going to be amplitude noise. Uh, we're going to sweep that. And what we're going to try and do is leverage the fact that our, our signal is going to be proportional to the overlap integral of the filter, which is this bottom purple thing, and the noise. And if the noise looks like a delta function, then we can effectively reconstruct the filter response from this. So we're going to perform these experiments, again, um, microwave manipulation, optical detection. And what I'm showing here is the infidelity, or the signal, I guess, uh, here as a function of the frequency of that applied modulation for two different classes of Slepian. So here's a k equals one first order Slepian, uh, and here's a k equals three third order Slepian. They're odd, so these are, these are kind of symmetrized. They'll implement an identity operation at the end of the day. The even order ones don't have to implement an identity. What you see is, again, in this purple target band, both controls, the Slepian and the square, this is in this case a rotary echo, uh, have a peak. But then if you look outside of that band, uh, in the Slepian case, we're limited by our measurement resolution of a, you know, half a percent or something uh, in fidelity. But in the case of this square wave control, you see that there is this spectral leakage that comes from these harmonics, just like you'd expect. It's the Fourier transform of a square wave. And you can see the same exact thing as you go to higher order, where now inside the target band, there may be much more complicated structure, but again, even at these higher orders, the Slepians guarantee that the out-of-band leakage is, is optimally minimized. So this is a demonstration, a direct probe, that the qubit is now susceptible only to noise within the target band that we've defined. We've pre-windowed our sensor by using the appropriate control. In addition to just doing that kind of characterization and taking advantage of the fact that the Slepians have the spectral concentration, we also want to be able to perform measurements that are similar to what one does in a classical setting where you do swept-tuned spectral estimation. You look over different bands. And Lorenza briefly showed this. What we do, uh, based on uh, an idea that goes back in the literature but that, uh, that Linoros brought to us, was we either modulate using a cosine or modulate using a single sideband transform, which is just a mathematical relationship that says you multiply this whole thing by, uh, in the single sideband case, a cosine plus the Hilbert transform of the waveform, so that's the Slepian in omega of t, times the sine of the modulation frequency, you get some other envelope. Now remember, this is again an envelope for a 12.6 gigahertz. So the frequency of omega s, the modulation, can be much, much lower than the ultimate carrier that this is on top of. And to understand how this works, you can look at this uh, simple illustration. You have now a band shifted, so it's a modulated Slepian waveform, right? This up and down comes from the modulation frequency that you're trying to achieve by shifting the band. If you look at this, whenever you're below the, uh, the horizontal midline, you're pi phase shifted, so it's like you're driving backwards, which means that if you have really, really slow noise, the slow noise is canceled by the symmetry of this structure and doesn't contribute to your sensor. If you have really, really fast noise, then the fast noise averages away in, in each cycle. But if you have noise illustrated by this gray line, which has about the same frequency as the modulation frequency, then the result is that you can have constructive addition of segments uh, when you're driving in one direction and in the other if, that, if those two frequencies are approximately matched. So this illustrates that the band of sensitivity should now be shifted to the modulation frequency just like in, in any kind of radio engineering. And this is what we see. So these are experiments where we do the same kind of 
fixed frequency uh, uh, system identification experiment. Uh, now you see that those things that used to give response at zero frequency uh, don't show anything there. And now we have the peak in the filter function out centered around the, uh, the shift frequency. Now again, these are single sideband. If you do cosinusoidal modulation, you would have the same structure mirrored around this midpoint. We've also done that. It works exactly the way you'd expect. We use this beyond the, the engineered noise spectrum uh, calculation or, or reconstruction that Lorenza showed briefly in her talk in order to characterize noise in our experimental system uh, in a way that to the best of our knowledge is not achievable using any classical device. What we did first in the top panel here is calibrate the sensitivity of our qubit-based sensor. This is a single ion that we're using to very small fluctuations in the amplitude of our microwave driving field. So we, we effectively just, as we move from left to right, we turn down the strength of this noise that we're adding in terms of a, of a amplitude modulation. And we show that we can get signal to noise uh, ratio of one when we're at 0.001 dB amplitude sensitivity. Now that's depending on what hardware you're talking about between 10 and 100 times better than what you can get from any commercial analyzer of, of amplitude noise because we're using the nonlinearity of the qubit as a transducer. But then what we can do is do swept tune spectroscopy and show that we now have spectral resolution, spectrally resolved information about the noise on the amplitude of our microwaves. Now this is something that Keysight cannot give you, but we can get from doing this kind of measurement. And it's important to note that at all of the points in this scan, we can do Ramsey interference type experiments and demonstrate that, we're, that the qubit is still coherent, that it's not any kind of other signal that's contributing to this. It's a direct probe of either noise or nonlinearity in the system at the absolute end of our synthesis chain. So it's not trying to pick things off and calculate what's going on in any attenuator or, or transmission line. This is actually sensing what's, uh, what's being detected at the qubit. Now, we can go a little further because I mentioned that you can have clutter coming from different quadratures of noise. Let's say you want to sense this, uh, this amplitude noise, but you have some background magnetic field fluctuations. In this case, you can use a tomographic reconstruction approach in order to combine just a few measurements on the qubit, projections along x, y, and z, so you do sequential measurements, in order to account for the fact that you can have different kinds of noise contributing to your signal. And it comes from the fact that when you take your qubit and you project into the x, y, and z projections, you can pull out the error part that comes from just, say, the amplitude quadrature as a combination of measurements in x, y, and z if you just combine them in the right way. So here, again, is, is this system identification approach, where now we're again looking at a signal which comes from amplitude noise, but we've added some clutter in the form of a white dephasing spectrum. If you just measure the px part, you get this. And that's the filter, but then you see that there's some vertical shift off the x-axis that you didn't see before. Now, a priori, if you just do that measurement, you do not know if it's because there's some other noise in your system, that's amplitude noise. But if you also measure the x and y projections, and then you combine them according to this, the data get transformed to this, which is what you expect for the purple line where you had no clutter in the first place. Right? So this is a way by a simple tomographic reconstruction scheme, you can remove the ambiguity of what kind of noise you're detecting. Now, we want to use that and address an additional problem. And that problem, uh, it, it gets a little bit at what was discussed during the, the Q&A section in the, uh, in the last talk, where we look again at our Hamiltonian, we have the multiplicative noise term, and we have this additive dephasing term. And now, so what we've, what we've talked about till now is Slepian control where we're sensing commuting noise. We're sensing amplitude noise, this beta omega term, as I was indicating. But now we want to do Slepian control to sense this ambient dephasing. If you want to say do magnetometry, this is what you would try to do. If you look at the response of the qubit to this noise, this is what we've been relying on. The fact that there's the omega of t, which is, in our case, the Slepian-shaped pulse uh, in a time convolution with the, the noise. But if you look at the form of what you get in terms of things that are sensitive to this beta z term, the noise in the z uh, uh, quadrature, you see that now you don't have that nice uh, uh, just Slepian waveform. You have the sign of this thing, which is the time integral of 
that waveform. So that's a highly nonlinear response, as we were hearing. And if you look at what is the amplitude, I didn't, so you'll note, my computer was sitting up here the whole time, and I did not add this slide at the end. Um, if, you, if you take that control modulation that we started with, and you calculate the amplitude filters, everything is, is copacetic, and, and you're happy with it. But if you look at the phase response filters, uh, well, first of all, you don't have spectral concentration, and you haven't band shifted in the way you hope. So we have to do something more. And uh, uh, effectively, what we do is a simple linearization procedure. And this, this was a, a, an idea that came from Lee and Lorenza, where you take that sign and you can, in the small angle approximation, linearize just by taking that Slepian and moving to the time derivative of the Slepian. So you calculate a finite difference of it, which takes care of some of the nonlinearity you're seeing. So the Slepian that you started with now gets transformed into this new finite difference waveform. And it's kind of interesting that the finite difference waveform of the kth order Slepian looks very similar to the k plus one order Slepian, right? So every time you do this, it looks like the next higher order uh, Slepian. When you do that, and you again measure the dephasing quadrature filter, using that tomographic reconstruction, to do this, you have to measure px, py, and pz, and combine them. Now you see that for the unshifted, you have this spectral concentration near zero, and for the shifted version, you have spectral concentration near, in this case, 10 kilohertz, which was the applied modulation frequency. So you recover the properties of the Slepian for sensing ambient noise, this additive dephasing, uh, just by moving to this finite difference. Um, for those of you who are interested in this, but are unable for technical reasons to do completely arbitrary waveform uh, uh, generation and input into your system, you can also do almost the same thing using pulse dynamic decoupling, where you construct the pulse dynamic decoupling sequences according to a Slepian embedded in a CPMG. So if you're interested in that, we can show you more about that. We've also done exactly this kind of, of measurement and shown that you get the same uh, band shifting and spectral concentration problems. There's just some other complications that come with it. Uh, but that's a case where you don't have to do arbitrary pulse shaping, you just have pi pulses. So now I want to move on to uh, uh, the next technical part of the talk, where we're interested in this interface between the virtual layer and quantum error correction. Where again, instead of noise spectroscopy characterization, we're going to think about reducing the likelihood of error for quantum computing. Of course, we talk a lot about reducing error probability, but there's another part of the game which is talking about error correlations. Because underlying, at a very general level, underlying most quantum error correction algorithms is an assumption of IID uh, statistics that is uh, independent, identically distributed, which is certainly convenient mathematically, but is also not what we see in real laboratory settings, where we always have long time correlations, we have spatial correlations of the noise in qubits. We wanted to probe these kinds of correlations. We're going to focus uh, in my talk today on temporal correlations and what role control has in modifying those. Now to start with, I wanted to introduce just a little bit of work uh, that uh, my student Harrison Ball did. He's now uh, a senior quantum control engineer at Q-Control, looking at uh, a slightly different problem, which was what happens to quantum verification procedures like randomized benchmarking and in another case, um, gate set tomography, when you have strongly correlated noise. Because again, these were protocols developed in you know, Manny's original papers where you assume that you just have some probability of error P and it's stochastic, but that's again not realistic. What Harrison was able to calculate analytically was the distribution of outcomes under randomized benchmarking for all the different random sequences when you either have rapidly fluctuating uncorrelated or Markovian noise, uh, and not to get into the Markovian versus non-Markovian debate, some, some kind of slowly fluctuating uh, control noise uh, or ambient noise. And, and it's illustrated here as a, as a heat map where you see in the case of, of the fast fluctuating noise, you get some distribution that's approximately Gaussian centered around the mean, and this is the distribution over different randomized sequences. But if you have some very strong correlated noise, in this case some DC offset, you end up with this enormous distribution. And that distribution, first of all, is shifted towards very high fidelities. The mode of the distribution is shifted towards higher fidelities, so these are error suppressing. But you have a tail that effectively goes down to you know, you know, complete decoherence. Analytically, both of these can be described by something called a gamma distribution. 
And I'm telling you this because I want to use this as a tool, as a marker for correlations. Just a tiny bit of background here. What we effectively do in that calculation is we map the noise in our system and its interaction with this randomized benchmarking sequence, a, a long chain of Cliffords applied to the qubit as a random walk in Pali space. Now, it's not actually a random walk. It's a deterministic walk, deterministic based on the structure of the underlying randomly chosen sequence. And the important thing is that there are some sequences which when you take this kind of, you, you, you put a, a Z error operator in between the Cliffords that correspond to all the Cliffords up to that location, all the Cliffords after, you get a Pali as a result of that. You take all those Pallies and, and put them in a chain for each time, for each step in the sequence. You see that some sequences have random walks that move far away from the origin and some random walks go out in, in this Pali space and then come back towards the origin. Because the measure of fidelity is linked to the length of the walk in three space, this is a proxy measure for whether a sequence is actually error suppressing or error enhancing in the case of correlated errors. And this shouldn't be too surprising because at least one valid uh, uh, randomized benchmarking sequence is spin echo, where you do a whole bunch of identities, a pi x in the middle and a whole bunch of identities at the end. It's unlikely you get that when you randomly choose, but it's a valid randomized benchmarking setting. So we know that these do have echo-like physics, and that's captured in these short walk sequences. So one thing we can do is engineer noise in our system, perform randomized benchmarking with different sequences, and each, each dot here is a different sequence where we've calculated the length of the walk, because you just, if you know the sequence, you can just calculate that walk, and we measure the probability, probability to be in the dark state, which is like infidelity, uh, as, we, as we look at sequences with different walk lengths, and we see this approximately linear relationship when the noise is correlated, but for the exact same sequences when the noise we add is uncorrelated, there's effectively, there's no measurable relationship between walk length and error. Now you can capture that if you again look at those random walks. So what I'm plotting here are the termination points of random walks when the noise is correlated on the left and uncorrelated on the right. Here's one walk for one of eight sequences. And then we have a whole huge collection of different noise realizations, different ways in which the noise occurs. What you see is that the termination points, which correspond to how much error you have at the end of applying that sequence, when you have correlated errors, for a single sequence, they all lie on a line. All you do is rescale the length of the walk. But when you have uncorrelated noise and you randomize each step, you end up with this kind of near uniform distribution. That is what accounts for the difference in what we see in these measurements. So when you look at just the histogram of outcomes, what you see is that, again, in the red data, these is, this is randomized benchmarking performed in the presence of uncorrelated noise versus black randomized benchmarking in the presence of correlated noise. We have an approximately Gaussian peak uh, for the uncorrelated case and this broad thing, both of which are described well by gamma distributions. These are not fits, these are zero parameter calculations overlaid with our uh, experiments uh, based on that gamma distribution I showed you before. But something more interesting emerges when you look at how the variance of these different distributions scales with re repetitions, with averaging. When you do that, you get data that looks like this. So what we're plotting now is the variance of this in red and the variance of the black one in, in the gray as we perform more and more experiments. Again, this is experimental data, uh, and all I've done here is shuffled the data in lots of different ways, that's why you have this big scatter, to remove any systematic biases in the averaging process as we move from left to right. The key signature is that when the noise is strongly correlated, and hence the errors are correlated in the sequence, you get some large variant saturation. So you get this broad distribution and it stays broad. If instead you have uncorrelated or Markovian errors in, in this description, you get an, a variant scaling, the width of that peak here in red, that goes down approximately like 1 over n, 1 over the number of repetitions of the measurements you've performed. This is going to be a key signature for us. And to get a little bit of insight into why this is, uh, aside from the mathematics of the gamma distribution, um, I, I like to invoke uh, some insights from the clock community. This is something, that, this physics is really well known if you're a precision frequency metrologist because it looks a lot like the way Allen variance scales. 
right? So here's a totally arbitrary numeric example to illustrate this point. I just made some noise in, in MATLAB or whatever, and then that's the black, and then I do a moving average to go from blue to green to red, right? So you average more and more together. As you average from black to red, and then you look at the variance over all these samples, you see that the variance narrows when you do this averaging, right? This is, it, this is just the physics that everybody knows about the, the properties of averaging. But if you add a correlation, in this case by adding a linear drift, just like slow noise in the Allen variance, the variance does not continue to decrease as you average because now you have this strong correlation which gives you a saturation in the variance, just like the saturation in the variance I showed you before. So, so far, all I've talked about is randomized benchmarking and the signatures of correlated errors in randomized benchmarking. And this variance scaling as a marker for whether your errors are correlated or not. I want you to recall this idea that quantum control can be used as a filter on noise. If you apply the right control, you get a filter function that's high pass, it suppresses low frequency noise, and you can take some input colored spectrum and whiten it. If you whiten noise, you are effectively removing correlations from that noise. Now, this is all expressed not at the level of fidelity, but in fact at the level of the operators describing each individual operation. And so this is like an effective spectrum, an effective error spectrum experienced by the qubit. So now what we're going to do is take our randomized benchmarking experiment and we're going to replace every single gate with a, a, an appropriately constructed error suppressing gate, like corpse for, ampli for, for dephasing noise or BB1 uh, or these Walsh gates that we like. And they're going to be appropriately selected noise filters to whiten the noise. When we do this, what we see is, again, the data on the left is what I showed you before, correlated versus uncorrelated. And now on the right, all of the noise applied to the system is correlated. We always have correlated noise. But the black data is the you know, standard primitive controls that I showed you before. It's the same as what I show on the left side. And the blue data is what you get in terms of the variance scaling when you simply replace, drop in replacement, every single Clifford operation in your randomized benchmarking sequence with a noise filtering version. And you see that you recover the kind of 1 over n like scaling associated with errors being statistically independent in these gates. Now you can do a, a, a pretty nasty calculation. This is work that was done primarily uh, in collaboration with Tom Stace and, and his team where you can, because we're doing engineered noise in these first tests, you can write down a first principles formula uh, to account for what the exact scaling should be like. Um, so you get, this is the, uh, you know, there's no free parameters in this, it's just a, a calculation for the primitive case uh, where we're doing these non-modulated gates. And then what we're going to do is we're going to replace the gates with the modulated ones like I showed you before, two different ones, corpse and WAMF, uh, a Walsh modulated filter. We know the strength of the errors we applied. We have a mixed spectrum of fast and slow noise. And then we fit to these two parameters to extract what the residual correlated and uncorrelated components are. And via this kind of calculation, that's, a, that's the, the fit here to these data, we can measure about a 370 times uh, reduction in the correlated error component, in the correlated noise component. And we see, you'll notice, that the uncorrelated part has gone up. And the uncorrelated part has gone up because we have fast noise and the corpse gates that we're employing here are longer. So you're interrogating over a longer period, the fast noise contributes extra error. So even in this case where we, we do have a net win by using corpse, the biggest win comes from changing the correlation structure of the error. And as the last experiment, I can just show you that we can do this in the laboratory with no engineered noise. We can take you know, our standard randomized benchmarking protocol we can replace all the gates with BB1 because we know that our biggest source of error is amplitude instability in our, in our microwave gates when we're talking about trying to get into the 10 to the minus 6 range of, uh, of fidelities. Um, this, this experiment was performed with a baseline fidelity of 2 by 10 to the minus 5. We're, we're kind of just below 1 by 10 to the minus 5 uh, with some modifications to the hardware now. But the important thing again, blue versus black distributions, the black distribution is for, is for the primitive, the blue is for BB1. This is a really interesting serendipitous case where the mean of those distributions is pretty much identical. 
the probability of error for using the error suppressing gate is no different than using the primitive gate. But if you look at the scaling of the distributions of the variance, you see this difference in the signature of the correlated errors for the primitive versus the uncorrelated behavior when we use these error suppressing gates. Now we can demonstrate that, you know, so this is the shot noise limit because there's no engineered noise, there's no pre-averaging, we're always limited by shot noise. Um, the scaling of this uh, indicates that the residual errors are faster than any of the engineered cases we considered in the first principle stuff that I showed you before. Um, and we can try to extract uh, what we're doing right now, what the effective correlation length is of errors in the experiment. So this is, it's this really weird circumstance where you can virtualize the errors. Even though the error likelihood is identical, you have totally different statistical properties that now can have significant impacts on, say, your choice of quantum error correction or the performance of quantum error correction that may be performed downstream. So again, we call that qubit virtualization. Just as a tiny bit of shameless advertising, um, you know, I've talked a lot about these single qubit experiments. If you're an experimentalist in the room and you're interested in, say, quantum simulation, uh, we also do work in, uh, in penning traps. So this is from a paper that was just on the archive a couple of days ago. Um, where we have uh, large crystals of beryllium ions with uh, site-resolved imaging. Uh, I'd invite you to read about that if, if, uh, if that's maybe more to your liking. Um, I wanted to, uh, to conclude uh, first by acknowledging our collaborators, in particular uh, Lorenza and Lee at Dartmouth, uh, the team uh, of uh, Will Oliver at MIT, the, the IARPA equal collaboration uh, led by Reiner Blatt, Center for Engineered Quantum Systems, um, as I mentioned, we have a research team at the University of Sydney, uh, some very talented people. Virginia Frey did the work on Slepians experimentally. Uh, and we also have a research team at, uh, at Q-Control that's more focused on building algorithms. And uh, I'll remind you again and, uh, and, and ask you politely to please consider signing up to get some free access to the software, which will incorporate a lot of the things I told you about today and hopefully help all of you leverage this kind of control. So thank you very much. Time for a few questions before we go to the break. Uh, Michael, when piecing your talk together with the one we just heard before, uh, when it comes to Slapians, wouldn't this uh, simply suggest that one track the response function and really see how the distorted uh, pulse sequences arrive uh, at the actual device and record noise spectra of, of those and, and, and try to counteract uh, unwanted noise by this? So, um, it, funny that you asked that. Uh, it, it sets <laughs> me up to give a good advertisement. One of the features that's being built into the Q-Control package um, but it's also just an interesting intellectual exercise uh, for those of you who don't like the commercialism, um, <laughs> is, is to have a, a pre-calibration procedure, right? So, so there's, in, in our view, there are two separate things that need to be done. One is to get some uh, information about the kind of coarse frequency response of the system at the end of the synthesis chain. So that is felt by the qubit after it goes onto the chip or out of the microwave horn antenna or whatever. And we have protocols where we can combine uh, kind of broadband sensing and narrowband sensing just to try and determine what the transfer function is of, you know, signal out of box, mm -hmm. signal felt by qubit. Then we combine that with the filter in order to do optimization to, you know, do the system identification after we correct for these first coarse uh, uh, perturbations and then shape and distort the Slepian pulse to make its filter response more like what we know this, the filter response should be. And uh, since you were mentioning the decoupling uh, sequences, uh, wouldn't it also suggest that one simply revisited uh, the decoupling sequences and uh, see where they are prone uh, uh, to noise? Uh, so uh, that now uh, one has compensated uh, decoupling sequences. So for instance, uh, in particular, when it comes to uh, 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 sensing dynamic data by relaxation behavior, for instance, uh, the relaxation behavior T1, T2 is typically uh, sensitive to spectral noise at very, very uh, specific regions. And therefore, uh, for instance, in practical NMR, I think uh, from your talks, it would be very, very advisable to give something like a guideline for the spectroscopists uh, 
which type of decoupling sequences and in which periods not to use when they perform certain types of experiments sure. so that they do not fold uh, unwanted noise into the part they want to, uh, want to measure. Absolutely, and I mean, in addition to that, of course, um, follows on work that, that Ed Barnes and Charlie Marcus did and that, that we've implemented separately as well, where you can make decoupling sequences with notch filters around certain frequencies to kill things that are known. In that case, it was gallium and arsenic uh, nuclear precession rates. Um, we do the same thing when we have uh, certain known spectral lines that contribute strongly to the noise. Well, you can just construct your control to have a, a zero in the filter at the, near that frequency. Michael, great talk as always. Uh, my question is also somewhat of a concern. Uh, we have, uh, I guess, now two requirements really, right, for quantum error correction, not just the error thresholds, but this idea of some level of Markio Markovianity. Um, so I like the idea that you can try to filter this noise to uh, give you that. Uh, but there is a hit to fidelity by having to use these sort of filtered gates. Is that true or not? Um, not in general. Um, it, it, it depends on the overlap of the, the noise and the spectrum. I mean, I can show you very quickly um, how this is manifested. Uh, so if I go back to where we show you the filter, right? Um, again, this is cartoonized, but it's, it's, a, it's a real set of filters. Um, if your noise is primarily in the shaded region, then you will have a net reduction in error by using these controls that also virtualize. If the noise is primarily in this little region, where you see that the filter for these new kinds of controls is above the filter for the primitive or standard gate, in that case, you get added error, right? Now, the, the critical thing is that, in general, an analytically described or analytically composed noise filter will have a longer duration in time, which is what accounts for that, right? So that may, in your system, drive down the error rate. But you can also do full kind of black box optimal control and get the, you know, the time hit to be much smaller. And what it really does is it takes this bump and it pushes it out to higher frequencies. So it's kind of more balanced in terms of that high frequency responsiveness to the primitive gate. So it absolutely is a consideration. Um, I wouldn't quite articulate it as a concern. OK. So unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for questions. So um, let's go to a 30-minute coffee break, and we'll reconvene uh, at 11.40 for the last speaker for this morning's session. Thank you. Thank you.